Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Multi-Tenancy in Kubernetes, Strategies and Considerations. And I am joined by Sachin, Senior Product Engineer, and Atul, Senior Developer Advocate. A little bit faster than the names. <laughs> From uh, InfraCloud Technologies, they'll pop up there in a second. And I'm Mike Peterson, uh, Senior Technical uh, Marketing Engineer at uh, Loft. Um, got a lot to cover today. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, let our, uh, our uh, two guests introduce themselves, if they would like, and then we've got some stuff to jump into. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. Sir. Hi, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Atul. Uh, I am Sachin Lobo. I am working as a senior product engineer at InfraCloud. Uh, I also work as uh, work with Loft uh, on their open source uh, project, the cluster, as well as the enterprise service offering, uh, which is also called as Loft. Uh, outside of work, I am a, a, a techie. I like to uh, be well versed with the current things that are happening in the technology world. Uh, I also like to listen uh, to music in my free time. Uh, uh, that's mostly about me. Yeah. And Atul? Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Atul, and I work as a senior developer advocate at InfraCloud. Uh, I'm also a CNCF ambassador, so I'm involved in a lot of activities around cloud native and Kubernetes. Uh, outside of work, you will see me eating out at a restaurant or going on road trips. So uh, that's a quick intro about me. So great to have both of you. Thank you for joining. I'll go ahead and uh, drop off. We'll go ahead and get into some some presentation materials. All right. Thanks. Cool. Yes. So uh, welcome everyone again. Uh, we'll be talking about multi tenancy in Kubernetes strategies and consideration. The agenda for today is fairly simple. We would be starting with the introductions, which uh, Mike already did. Then we would be deep diving into understanding what multi-tenancy actually is. Uh, we'll touch upon how to achieve multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, uh, along with a demo using V clusters. Uh, we'll also touch upon security and compliance considerations, because uh, that's quite important when it comes to uh, multi-tenancy. We'll touch upon our uh, use case, and then we would be open for question and answers. So uh, we were done with the introductions. Uh, I'm Atul, and I have Sachin with me. You can reach out to us on our Twitter handles mentioned here. Uh, and also, you can follow us on LinkedIn. So before I get uh, started, you know, you would be seeing this beautiful lights and the ambience behind me. So uh, I'm actually working from a co-working uh, co space here. And uh, one of the good things I like about this place is that you know there are people from different domains who work here. Uh, you know, someone's an architect, someone's an engineer, someone's a musician, and all of them are under one roof. Uh, some of them have their open desks, some of them their private cabins. Uh, in fact, the cabin just in front of me it has a lot of uh, you know greenery there. The, the person has put a lot of plants, a lot of photos, and uh, this room where I'm sitting, this is basically a shared uh, place. So anyone can book this particular conference room. They can come and attend conferences. Uh, you know, then then there's a pantry out there where I can go and grab a coffee. Uh, there's electricity, there's Wi-Fi, uh, and the company who is taking care of this entire setup, uh, it ensures that we have access to all these services. Uh, you know, we have proper internet, uh, the pantry is always full, and also security. So uh, there's also a security guard right out there. So access control is also taken care of. So what I just told you is actually multi-tenancy in real life, because we are different people working under one roof, but all of us have our own spaces that, uh, you know, we can personalize and use. And that's what multi-tenancy is, is actually. So when it comes to software, uh, it's basically multiple users accessing the same application instance. And uh, essentially, it's like if, if you would have used servers earlier, so you have a virtual machine, where, which is basically on a physical server, and a lot of people using that. Uh, essentially, that's what multi-tenancy is. Uh, and one of the major reasons why we do that is, uh, obviously, you know, we, we try to get out, get some performance out of it. But isolation of data is quite uh, critical here. So. From a resource uh, point of view, what multi-tenancy allows is that you can share your resources among uh, the other uh, other tenants who are present on the particular uh, system. So uh, the example that I gave you about the building, that is similar how it works in case of software as well. So you might have, uh, you know, you have compute that would be shared between the tenants. You might have memory, you might have network that would be shared between the tenants. 
so that is uh, shared resources and that is where you know multi tenancy helps where resource utilization is optimum uh, also you know when we are sharing infrastructure and various resources uh, there is cost involved so the cost here is quite uh, you know comparatively very uh, low if i can say so it's cost effective uh, because it actually eliminates the need for a separate uh, you know instance for a particular customer so for instance if you have a customer who needs a dedicated space now in case of multi tenancy that same dedicated space can be utilized by multiple customers so in that case it's cost effective uh, for the customers as well and for you as a provider as well because you know it it, it comes in with economies of scale uh, you know to say about it. and lastly the maintenance is relatively simple when it comes to uh, multi tenancy and why i say that is since you have one single platform where you have multiple users using it uh, when you want to do things like let's say you want to perform an upgrade or there is a new patch that you want to apply to the system instead of doing it individually for every customer you can just do it on your main uh, you know resource so let me if you're talking about a cluster we do it on a cluster and it will be automatically applied to all the other tenants who are present so uh, that is pretty much about what multi tenancy is uh, quite basic so i know a lot of people who who would have joined in probably for them this would be a refresher sort of and uh, multi tenancy like i said you know it's 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 quite popular and for for various reasons like you mentioned resource utilization cost as well as maintenance there are a lot of industries different industries and domains that make use of multi tenancy so uh, a few of them what i have mentioned here so basically the saas software providers so for example all of us use email so you know we have the email we have outlook and other email providers so that is basically essentially a good example of multi tenancy for saas providers because all of us have our individual mailboxes uh, which is isolated from the other person so we cannot see what the other person uh, you know is seeing in their mailbox but essentially all of this is running on a shared infrastructure so i'm using the compute i'm using memory i'm using the network uh, everything from a shared resource while i have my own mailbox so saas companies are a great example of multi tenancy uh, we can also look at uh, multi tenancy from a retail uh, point of view as well so uh, you you would have come across a lot of retail stores uh, present in different geographical locations so what happens is that in such situations the uh, individual store gets their own instance where they can you know do their day to day task related to their store uh, as well as they get access to the shared resources so they can do things like inventory management so they can check the inventory at the entire geography level uh they have access to the crm so this this is a simple example when it comes to retail obviously you know this would be tailor made for different institution different uh, you know retail stores depending on their use case and lastly large enterprises that have multiple domains uh it multi tenancy suits them as well so if you see most of the companies today have different functions within the company itself so uh, barring the technical team so when you have your tech team you will have your development team you have your testing team your devops etc 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 but even outside of your tech team you will have marketing you will have legal you will have finance so on and so forth so for each of these teams it's it's always better to give them an instance a separate instance which is isolated from the other one rather than giving them uh, a dedicated cluster because again we did, we we uh, did go through the benefits so uh, these were a few use cases where multi tenancy can be uh, used which you can see uh, talking about kubernetes especially because you know kubernetes today powers most of the internet i won't be wrong in uh, saying that it is dubbed as the uh, operating system for the cloud so when it comes to kubernetes there are two broad categories of uh, multi tenancy one is hard multi tenancy the other one is soft multi tenancy and the whole idea between the multi tenancy types is the isolation so the hard multi tenancy provides you a very good level of isolation so that's where you have your dedicated space nobody else is sitting on that space uh, nobody can see what's happening you control everything so uh, that is what hard uh, multi tenancy means when you come to the other side which is soft multi tenancy that is where you generally deal with logical uh, abstractions and separation so essentially you would be dealing with a shared infrastructure on top of which you will have various customers various tenants who would be using who would be logically separated from each other so 
there are three uh, different types of multi tenancy models if i can say that uh, you know we would be discussing today the first one is separate cluster per tenant so this is a hard multi tenancy type so if you see the diagram on the right you actually see that every tenant has its own cluster so in this case you know each each tenant is allocated their dedicated cluster and this provides with complete separation and they have their own uh, you know i mean they can manage their own resources configuration and they're completely independent from the other one so there are different use cases where you might need this uh, depending on uh, you know what the requirement is for example if you are working with a client who says that you know data is extremely important to them it's just someone in the finance domain for example so they they are the ones who need extreme extreme level of security and uh, isolation so we could uh, you know to go for this particular uh, mode uh, talking about pros and cons and uh, before i deep, uh, dig into them again you know the, all the types that we would be discussing today it actually depends on your use case so uh, the pros and cons is something that would change based on a use case as well so uh we would just like to say that there is nothing right or wrong it just depends on what situation or what use case you are dealing with so quickly touching upon the pros of uh separate cluster per tenant so definitely isolation because uh, they have their dedicated cluster and it avoids interference from any other tenant so they it's, it's just there uh resource allocation you know each tenant can independently allocate and manage their own resources so there's no uh there's no issue of any other tenant coming and you know using your resources so that that's not going to happen and obviously this gives the best level of security because you are the whole sole user of that particular cluster uh coming to the other side of the coin you know there, there is a, a certain overhead that is involved here and that is mostly from the service provider side which comes into maintenance and management of these multiple clusters because as your customer base grows every customer if 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 every customer has one cluster then it will be really difficult to manage those clusters you know uh, upgrade security access control etc etc uh even for when you talk about resource utilization sometimes it might happen that you have provided a certain amount of resource to a particular tenant but then it's always underutilized and that's where you are actually wasting a certain amount of resource so there are chances of improper resource utilization uh and uh, scalability can be a concern because uh, you know individual scaling individual cluster can be complex because if they, they are individual uh, cluster which are sitting on different node pools and uh, you no know, nodes and uh, it requires a lot of planning and additional coordination because you know moving them scaling up and down uh, you know without downtimes and uh, other complexities might get difficult as well uh, moving on to the uh, soft multi tenancy mode where which, which we are going to talk about is the namespace per tenant so as a namespace every tenant has their own namespace and namespace is a logical separation so you can see that in the diagram as well so each tenant has access to their namespace eventually running on the same cluster which is shared so each tenant is given a dedicated namespace within the cluster and it enables logical isolation along with resource uh, allocation for each of the tenant now in this case you know uh, there there is there is certain level of isolation uh, it's it's not completely isolated but then it does uh, you know have some some measures in place especially if you use some access management controls in place you have one tenant who is assigned to a namespace will not be able to see or do any perform any action into the other namespace uh, you know that is there uh, also each tenant can manage and allocate their resources within their namespace so based on their requirements they can play around with the resources but again that all is uh, bound by the namespace that we have and uh, talking about efficiency you know resource utilization is optimized because uh, you know the, the resources are shared so you, you know the problem of under utilization of resources that can be avoided in this case because everything is shared and you can Uh, you know manage how the resources are shared between different namespaces uh flipping on the other side of the coin you know there are namespace level uh, uh limitations that come into picture especially there are namespace level resource quotas and limits and uh, you know you need to manage them in a way that you are not affecting the other namespaces or the uh, other logical abstractions on your cluster so that is where you know you need some sort of planning uh, you know you might have some sort of complexity there as well uh, 
Second is, you know, obviously security. Now, because you have all the tenants sitting on the same cluster and they're just logically separated, uh, security is a big concern here. So in case you don't have proper access control mechanisms in place or proper access policies, that will become really difficult. Uh, you know, security will be a challenge here. There would be threat that, you know, one tenant can actually see and access what's happening with the other tenant. And uh, lastly, there would be some degree of complexity. Again, because, uh, you know, it, it's not like running one namespace on a single cluster on my laptop. It's We are talking about scale. We are talking about a lot of tenants. So if you have a Kubernetes uh, cluster and you have, let's say, hundreds of namespaces, managing the namespaces itself is a task. So uh, that is an additional level of complexity that is added into this. But again, it gives you the flexibility. There is sharing of resources. Uh, there, there is some degree of isolation. So it makes good sense to you know, use this in, for, in some uh, use cases. The next one, what we are going to talk about is the virtual cluster for tenant. So virtual cluster essentially are fully working Kubernetes clusters that run on another Kubernetes cluster. So I have a cluster on cluster uh, concept. It is similar to like you can uh, you can imagine a virtual machine running on a bare metal server. So similar to that, I have a Kubernetes cluster, and I have a virtual cluster that is running on top of it. So virtual cluster basically reuse the worker nodes uh, that is present for the host controller, and they also utilize the networking from the host controller. So uh, host cluster, sorry. So on the host, you have a virtual cluster, and it takes it actually reuses the worker nodes, the network as well. And every virtual cluster has their own control plane. And because of that, what they do is all the workloads that are scheduled are done on a single namespace, which is present on the host cluster. So uh, this would be made easier if you look at the diagram. So what happens actually is on the shared cluster, we create there is a namespace that is created. And within the namespace, we have a virtual cluster, which is given access to a particular tenant. So tenant one access, uh, accesses virtual cluster one, which is within a namespace one. Now, because virtual cluster has all the uh, uh, you know bells and whistles of a proper, basically it's a full Kubernetes cluster which is running. So uh, it is it itself is a Kubernetes cluster. And what that does is that for uh, each tenant, it feels that it's, it's running on their own cluster. Actually, it's not. It's just a namespace. So that's the degree of uh, you know isolation it, it gives. So you know that's one of the pros for virtual clusters. It it provides a perception of isolation. So tenants can experience the benefit of a dedicated cluster while being on a uh, you know shared cluster, and they also have the logical separation in place uh, by and also sharing the uh, underlying resources. So. That's where you know even the resource utilization is taken care of because it is shared among all the uh, you know other virtual clusters. So you know we can reduce the overhead because of uh, because of the resources being shared. And uh, scaling virtual clusters is relatively easier because you know uh, these are very easy to uh, provision. So the moment we deploy a virtual cluster on a Kubernetes cluster, it's, it's quite quick because uh, you know because of the necessary abstractions that are in place. So scaling them is quite easy, and that's why it, it becomes a go-to choice for a lot of uh, you know providers where because it provides the necessary isolation, plus it also gives the tenant the benefit of uh, you know that they're the only it's it's dedicated uh, cluster for them. Uh, talking about funds, uh, there is a potential. So, so the word over here is potential. Uh, there is a potential performance overhead as well as management overhead when it comes to virtual clusters. Uh, why is that? Because virtual clusters, if you see from the diagram itself, it introduces an additional layer of abstraction. So because of that, what might happen? There might be slight uh, uh, you know, performance issues. But then it again depends how well you optimize your entire underlying infrastructure as well as how you are deploying it. Uh, Similarly, because of that, the management can also be a uh, challenge here because you will have to include, uh, you know, take care of monitoring, troubleshooting, applying patches, updates. So that again has to be taken care of. And uh, again, so like I said, you know, the, the word uh, potential is the key here because it completely depends on how you are managing it. Uh, and it can be a very high degree of uh, overhead or it can be completely similar to what we have uh, seen in the earlier uh, use cases. 
so these were the three larger uh, multi tenancy techniques which we can use in kubernetes uh, you know right, right from a very hard uh, multi tenancy approach where we talk about we spoke about single cluster per tenant and we can eventually come to virtual cluster which gives the tenant a feel of that they are working on a dedicated cluster by still being a logical separation and like i said earlier you know the choice between hard and soft multi tenancy actually depends on a lot of factors uh it depends on the degree of isolation that is required the amount of customization your tenant requires the resource efficiency and also the security considerations so uh, you know hard multi tenancy as i said you know offers the strongest uh, isolation because that's completely isolated every tenant has a dedicated uh, you know cluster for themselves while soft multi tenancy promotes efficiency uh, and cost savings while maintaining the adequate level of isolation that has to be there so uh virtual clusters is something that we would be focusing on and one type of virtual cluster is v cluster that we would be talking about in the next section yeah hi so uh, let us now look at what is v cluster uh, so v cluster uh, here is an implementation of the virtual cluster per tenant model that we just discussed uh, it is an open source project by loft labs and it lets you create lightweight kubernetes clusters on top of your host cluster uh, it is also a clcf certified uh, kubernetes distribution which means that it behaves just like a normal kubernetes cluster uh, it has its own control plane so users uh, they get the feeling that they are being connected to a uh, standalone dedicated cluster inside of a v cluster a tenant gets full access so uh, they can use this v cluster to install and test any kinds of uh, you know cluster scope resources uh, like crds now this is not possible in the case of uh, you know the namespace based model uh, without uh, taking the help from a cluster admin uh, plus there would be scenarios uh, where there would be conflicting uh, version requirements be between different tenants uh, so here essentially what cl v cluster allows is it allows you to partition a single physical cluster into multiple virtual ones and you can have one uh, virtual cluster for each tenant and now this allows more efficient use of the host cluster while it also provides uh, the isolations that the tenants desire uh, next let's look at how v cluster works uh, so when you once you uh, deploy v cluster uh, v cluster runs as a pod inside a regular namespace on the host cluster it gets deployed as a stateful set uh, now which contains two components first is the v cluster api server and the next is actually the second component is a sinker uh, whenever the user interacts with the v cluster api uh, the, the using the v cluster service for default it is actually uh, a, a, it is by using a v cluster service which is created on the host name space itself it is a regular kubernetes service so users can actually interact with it just like any other kubernetes service and it can also be exposed using an ingress or a load balancer what we see in this diagram here is how things would look like uh, when we have two v clusters created uh, user request uh, usually reaching the v cluster control plane uh, the v cluster control planes are the blue boxes that are marked in blue uh, in the bottom left and right corners uh, so when once a request uh, comes to this control plane uh the api server the v cluster api server would actually persist these resources in its own data store uh the controller manager of the v cluster uh, now uh, what it will do it will create all those child resources uh, for this particular request in our case it could be a deployment which will create a replica set which in turn would create the desired number of pods uh the sinker would actually be watching for this particular events and it would only sync the lower level uh, uh, resources in our case those would be the pods and the services uh, you will see that when when the sinker sinks down the resources it uses a very specific naming convention uh, and it translates the names uh, when it does from the uh, virtual cluster to the host host cluster the format being used here is uh, from it is basically of this format like it's it starts with the resource name then it has the v cluster name space in between and finally it has the v cluster name as the suffix so uh, this actually helps us uh, to prevent naming conflicts arising when we have similarly named resources in two different name space on the uh, virtual cluster 
Uh, next, let us see what are the advantages of using V clusters. Uh, so since V clusters have their own separate control plane, they allow you to provide a fair bit of isolation to the tenants by default. Uh, you can use other uh, isolation modes at the network level or at the workload level to configure this even further as per the tenants requirements. As V clusters allow you to partition your host clusters into multiple virtual clusters, it helps in achieving the reduction in overall costs for managing the clusters. This also allows you to manage all the uh, installed virtual clusters from a single place, thereby reducing the overall management overhead. V clusters also allow you to sync certain resources from the host cluster to the V clusters. For example, you can have something like an ingress controller that has been installed in the host and uh, you can have this synced into all the each of the virtual clusters. So you just need to install it once on the host clusters and uh, your tenants just use the uh, ingress rules uh, to define uh, uh, the, uh, the CRs, the custom resources to define their specific rules. Uh, finally, you can also assign resource quotas and uh, limit ranges for each uh, virtual cluster namespace that is totally independent. Now this allows you to control and manage uh, tenant resources usage and ensures that you have a fair usage of the uh, host cluster resources. Let us now look at certain specific features that uh, you know V cluster provides. Uh, the first one is basically the pause resume. Uh, what essentially it does is it will scale down uh, the uh, V cluster uh, stateful set as well as any uh, workloads like deployments and replica sets that are running in the V cluster. So your V cluster will no longer be consuming any resources at all uh, during this time. Once you resume the V cluster, uh, it will scale up the replica sets to the previous state. So all your workloads are back. You can uh, choose to apply certain uh, init manifests. For example, certain gate is manifest by default whenever you are creating a virtual cluster. Now this is useful for users looking to configure certain internal uh, V cluster resources. Uh, you can configure the uh, V cluster to run in rootless mode. So this is useful in scenarios that the policies on the host clusters, they do not allow running containers uh, with root users. Or maybe you want to run them uh, in, uh, in the rootless mode by default. V clusters also support the plugin model. So you can create your own plugins to extend the capabilities of V cluster and make it more suitable for your custom uh, use case scenario. And finally, by default, when we create a V cluster, it uses the K uh, K3S distro by default. But V cluster also has support for K0S, K8S, and EKS. And you can actually configure them uh, uh, when you are creating the virtual cluster by using the distro flag. Uh, next, let, let us look at a short demo of how V cluster helps us in achieving multi tenancy. We will head on to the V cluster page over here uh, and, and we click on getting started. Uh, this will basically detail us on the, uh, the steps that we require to install vCluster CLI. Uh, at the same time, we also have uh, vCluster, uh, uh, the help chart uh, using which we can actually create any vClusters that we require. Uh, so again, again, this is a very description that you will find here, uh, how to go about it. Uh, for this demo, I have a locally running kind cluster and uh, uh, Let's let's check out uh, you know the CLI uh, the current version with that we are running is 0.15.2. Uh, for this demo, we actually will go ahead with uh, uh, two uh, customers, basically Acme Corporation and Wayne Enterprises. Uh, on the left hand pane, we will see that how we create a virtual cluster. As you can see, I have just uh, run the v cluster create command with update current equals to false. What it is going to uh, do is it is going to create a virtual cluster but it is not going to update the currently running context. Uh, so it is going to write the context for this uh, particular V cluster back to the uh, currently uh, working directory. Uh, and we will be using this particular context uh, to connect to uh, this particular virtual cluster. We'll use this to uh, list the currently running namespaces. As you can see, we have only four uh, namespaces in the virtual cluster, but when I go to the host, I can see two additional ones that are being deployed on the host. Okay, we will go go back to the uh, to the terminal and we will go uh, to the Wayne uh, customer. Here we will create a, a particular uh, virtual cluster for Wayne, but we will select the distro to be K0s. 
so what it is going to do again it is going to create a virtual cluster but this time around it is going to actually use the k0s as, as the api server uh, let us wait for uh, the virtual cluster to get created and after that we are going to uh, just basically go ahead and uh, list the namespaces uh, for for that particular uh, virtual cluster so as you can see i have just uh, detailed the uh, got the detailed listing of the namespaces here we have a different set of uh, namespaces uh, specific for the k0s cluster uh, let's just now go ahead and create a namespaces for the for the web uh, for the particular application that we are going to create as you can see the web namespace got created in in acme corporation but again if we see that in vain we do not see it so this is the isolation uh, that we are getting when we are doing it virtual uh, via the virtual clusters uh, as you can see here again on the host we do not have the web uh, namespace yet so uh, we'll go ahead and create the web namespace uh, on the vain customers v cluster as well uh, going back to acme what we will do is we will take nginx deployment as as a uh, a saas application for this particular customer Uh, we will go ahead and look at uh, the nginx deployment so uh, what we are doing here is we are setting one as the replica count uh, but what we are doing is we are going to overwrite uh, the default uh, page that this nginx deployment is going to return and uh, let us go ahead and look uh, at the config map that we are going to use uh, to do this uh, so as you can see that for this config map we have a custom message uh, that shows that welcome to uh, the acme corporation so this is going to be a custom message for uh, the acme loading page uh, we will go ahead and create the uh, both these resources uh, starting with uh, ob obviously the custom resource because that is a dependency uh, once that is created we will go ahead and create the nginx deployment in our case uh, so we will wait for that as the, the resource has been created uh, we will try to do the same here uh, for the vain customer uh, again we will go ahead and check uh, the nginx deployment if you see uh, we have marked the replica count as 2 for this particular uh, nginx deployment but we are doing the exact same thing uh, uh, we are uh, overriding the default page uh, for the nginx deployment uh, is going to return again we will just see the uh, config map uh, over here as you can see this is a different uh, message altogether for the vain customer uh let's now go ahead and create this resources for the vain customer as well so again we start first with the uh, the config map and going ahead we then uh, deploy the nginx deployment in this particular case so i uh, uh, right now we have these resources created for both the customers what we will do is we will go and check in the host as to what has happened uh, because of these two actions as you can see on the host inside uh, we cluster acme namespace we are able to see one nginx deployment pod that has been scheduled with the appropriate namings again with vain we have two nginx deployments uh, and you can see the name translation uh, that we earlier talked about so uh, you can see those pods have been uh, synced to the host cluster uh, let us now go ahead and try to expose this nginx deployment uh, we are creating a basic service but of type load balancer because we want to access it from outside uh you can also go ahead and uh, create an end, uh, ingress for this uh, which is uh, pretty much the same uh we will actually go ahead and create the service uh again for vain customer uh, we will, we are going to do the exact same thing it's kind of the same service same type same load balancer the target port being 80 which is the default port for nginx uh, again even here we are going to create uh, the service uh once the services have been created uh, what we'll do is will actually list the services uh, in the appropriate namespace where they are created in our case it is in the uh, web particular namespace and from the list we will be able to gather the public ip using which we will be able to hit this particular service as you can see i've just gathered that i'm going to just visit that particular ip as you can see this is the service that you know uh, resides within acme corporation and we are greeted with the custom message for acme we will do the same for uh, the vain service so we'll just list the services in the web uh, namespace and here we have a different uh, public ip for the service for uh, vain if we go ahead and visit that particular ip you can see a different custom message uh, for vain enterprises so uh, as you can see this is kind of you know we have uh, uh, different services for different customers uh, 
and each of them are being able to manage them on their own. Uh, you can also see these services are also being uh, sent to the host cluster with the appropriate name translation. Uh, the first one was for the main customer, and here you can see uh, the one for the Acme customer. Uh, while we are at it, uh, what we'll do is we will also uh, have a look at the pause resume feature of B cluster. So we'll go to V cluster vain namespace. Uh, here you can see the two uh, pods for Nginx deployment running. Uh, now we'll go to the vain customer. This uh, this is by default on the on the host. If we list the V clusters, you can see both the V clusters running. Even the vain one is marked as running. We will go ahead and pause this particular uh, uh, vain virtual cluster and just try. It will scale down all the uh, both the stateful set for the V cluster as well as the any workloads that were running inside it. If we list the V clusters now, you will see that it is marked as paused. So, uh, you know, uh, right now what has happened is uh, all, the, all the particular workloads have been scaled down to zero. We will go ahead and resume uh, Wayne back to normal. And now if you do a listing, it will say that it is still in running mode. And you, you can see uh, on the host, one by one, uh, it will start uh, uh, getting the deployments and the stateful state back to their original, uh, uh, how it was before uh, we actually paused the particular V cluster. So in this demo, we have actually seen how we can use V cluster uh, to basically implement multi-tenancy, uh, as well as we also saw how we can use a different distro while creating a V cluster. And uh, at the same time, uh, we, we, we did also add a quick look at the pause and uh, resume feature within V cluster. Uh, yeah, that was it for the demo. Perfect. So I think with all the uh, goof up that we had in this particular demo, uh, you know, the statement goes well that, you know, is it even a demo if you don't have a goof up? So, so we yeah. had uh, uh, a little bit of pink issues here and there, but then that's what happens in uh, live uh, webinars. So uh, what we'll be doing is that, you know, post the event is done, we would be sharing the video as well in case, uh, you know, it didn't, it, it didn't work out for anyone, you know, whether it was blurry or it didn't load up anything, we would be uh, sharing the videos as part of the post-event uh, communication. So uh, thanks a lot, Sachin, for the demo. I think uh, we can get back uh, to the slides. And uh, the demo that you saw was, you know, purely around virtual clusters. And the example that I started with, you know, the, the real-life example of multi-tenancy to coming into how it can be done on Kubernetes cluster. And then eventually uh, Sachin showing us how we can do it using virtual clusters uh, as well. So uh, one of the larger concerns when it comes to multi-tenancy is obviously security and isolation because uh, while you are trying to reduce the costs and improve the operational uh, capabilities, what is essentially happening is that the isolation between the customers or your tenants is not that great. So in such cases, security and compliance is a major concern. So what I've done here is I have listed a few hardening measures uh, that that uh, you know that one can focus on, and the inspiration for these uh, hardening measures is from the Kubernetes hardening guide, which is uh, published by the uh, NIA's uh, cyber uh, the sorry NIA's uh, cyber security uh, wing. So they actually put out this guide for the federal, and state, as well as any other organization who are using Kubernetes, and they have listed out pretty nicely on the various measures that you should uh, you know take take when you are talking about multi-tenancy. So uh, if you are interested, you know, do uh, Google and go ahead and, uh, you know, look for that document. I'm sure you will learn quite a lot uh, from that. So uh, touching upon some important aspects from that particular document, you know, Kubernetes spot security is uh, something which is extremely critical when you are uh, running workloads in a multi-tenant setup. So you need to ensure that you have you are using proper access mechanisms in place. So you restrict the access and uh, make sure that the containers that are used to build the applications or run the workloads are running as non-root. So you need to disable the root access uh, by default. And whenever possible, you try to run the containers with immutable file systems because uh, that's that's how you know you are going to ensure that your pod or whatever workload is there that is uh, secured. Uh, and also along with, you know, you, you utilize the various security features uh, that Kubernetes provides out of the box. Uh, you know, things like RBAC. We'll, we'll talk about it in the uh, other section as well. Uh, you know, also the next step when it comes for uh, 
from a security point of view it's more on the network side as well because what happens is uh, when 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 in a multi tenant setup you have a lot of workloads a lot of clusters uh, namespaces and a lot of network between them so there's a lot of communication a lot of traffic that's going on between all of these uh, uh, you know system so first and foremost uh, have a firewall make sure your entire system sits uh, behind a firewall so that's the first grade of uh, security uh, that that you want to have in place uh, secondly what you also need to do is you need to ensure that the communication between all these pods is actually encrypted so go ahead and implement mpls uh, for, for all the parts that is that are present so you know that uh, you know there is no middleman attacks that can be done because your entire traffic is actually encrypted and uh, also you know limit the access to underlying kubernetes uh, resources or uh, Uh, you know objects for example you don't want anyone to access your hcd uh, you know uh, deployments which is which is present there so uh, make sure that these these are some measures that you take place uh, that is that you actually deploy when it comes to uh, networking part of it uh, obviously the we cannot not discuss authentication and authorization because uh, that's the heart of uh, multi tenancy you need to ensure you have a proper a solid a robust authentication and authorization mechanism in place and uh, kubernetes out of the box it gives you rbac policies so you define the roles you define the permissions you define the groups and you define the people the services the the accounts that are supposed to be accessing your uh, workloads uh, you know you give them permissions and then ensure that you are implementing the rbac policies uh, correctly uh, however with the trend moving on uh, moving to a different direction uh, we are going towards the least privilege access which we often call as zero trust so zero trust is something which you uh, which you can also implement uh, in your cluster as a hardening measure because the, the principle behind zero trust is trust no one so there is no implicit access given to anyone they request for access for whatever they want and then the access is provided so uh, rbac is a good place to start but then zero trust is what you can probably build upon and have a robust secure authentication and authorization in place and lastly when you have all of these things in place what you also need is some sort of observability and monitoring in place so uh, due to time constraints we didn't actually uh, you know touch upon a lot on the observability and monitoring part but then that is very essential uh, in multi tenant setup because you have a lot of tenants a lot of uh, name spaces a lot of clusters that have been spread around and that's why you need to ensure that you have visibility into everything so uh, you know one important thing is you need to enable logging Uh, you need to have proper logs uh, for your infrastructure and when i say logs it's uh, not only the application logs uh, you need to ensure that you have access logs you have network logs you have uh, you know all sorts of security logs uh, that are present so make sure you have a thorough logging system in place and with that what you also need to ensure is that you persist the log for a particular time because when you are working at scale when you are working with enterprises when you are working with different customers uh, there are a lot of compliance requirements that comes in between and for compliance reasons there are different requirements that you need to persist your logs for x number of days or for x number of years as well so uh, talking about uh, compliance let us move into the uh, compliance considerations that is required so uh you know compliance is required for uh, any any in organization that's working irrespective of the industry because uh, when you adhere to certain rules regulation and compliances what you essentially do is that you not only have your systems in place which is following a particular guideline which is safe but in a way you also build trust among your customers and i and i think that is very important for any business you want your customers to trust you and that is where when you follow these compliances when you follow these requirements you you build a certain amount of trust uh, with your customers as well as stakeholders so uh, and it also helps you demonstrate a certain level of commitment in maintaining a secure and reliable kubernetes uh, environment that you are giving them uh, you know it's it's as simple as uh, let's say if you are going on a shopping site and you want to use your credit card you would want to you would be more uh, you know uh, easy or uh, willing to use it on a site which I, which is pci dss compliant uh, versus using it on a site which is not so uh, you know that's where compliance comes in so from a kubernetes standpoint of view uh, there is a kubernetes center for internet security which is cis benchmarks so this basic this group basically publishes a list of good practices and industry requirements for uh, you know especially from the network side Uh, as well as you know the entire kubernetes side 
as well. So what you can do is you can implement the recommendations which are provided by the Kubernetes CIS benchmarks. So that should be your stepping stone. Uh, the next thing that you would want to ensure is you need to uh, have regular audits and assessments in place because we all know that the tech landscape is changing at a rapid pace and what is happening today might not happen tomorrow. And with every passing day or with every passing hour, you have new vulnerabilities that are being discovered. So that is why you need to ensure that you are actually regularly auditing your entire infrastructure, identifying if your systems are still in line with the latest uh, good practices or the latest standards. And if there is any gap, you identify the gap and try to fill that. Uh, we spoke about role-based access control because access is the main thing because, you know, obviously multi-tenancy, so you want to ensure that only those people who require access to perform an action, only they have access to that particular resource. So RBAT is your go-to uh, you know, tool that you can use. Uh, next, you need to ensure that all the containers that are being used, uh, either by your customers or if, if, if you are a SaaS provider and if you are giving an offering, make sure that all these uh, images are actually signed and encrypted from a reliable source so that what what this does is that it gives you a guarantee that the images that you are using is actually verified and there are no loopholes there are no vulnerabilities in that so in such cases what will happen is that when you deploy a, 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 an image which is signed and approved you are secured in a way that you know there is no breach that is going to happen versus deploying untrusted uh, deploying container images from an untrusted source. Uh, we also focused on the, we emphasized on logging and monitoring as well, uh, the requirements of it. You know, you need to ensure that you have complete visibility into your infrastructure, into your application and get the logs, uh, monitor it. And eventually what you also need to do is you need to have a good incident response uh, mechanism in place as well as recovery. So when you're logging or a monitoring system actually alerts you of some service disruption or some, some issue, you need to have a plan in place, which basically is trying to address this particular issue that is being raised. And then you have a mechanism to mitigate that particular issue. So an incident response and recovery mechanism is also required for compliance. So these were just a few handful of things uh, where which you can implement to ensure that your compliance requirements are done. And uh, obviously, there are a lot of other things that you need to do, uh, you know, that you can perform. But these are the stepping stones that you can uh, take care of. Uh, so lastly, what we'll do is, you know, over the last one hour or so, we discussed about uh, multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, uh, you know, all the various types. We had a demo on vCluster. Uh, but then it's important to understand, uh, learn from a real-life example of what a multi-tenant cluster uh, actually does. So uh, what we are going to do is we are going to look at the case study of uh, Atlan. And if you have been familiar to these webinars, uh, you know, uh, you know, this was a use case which was discussed in a few webinars uh, prior to this one. And the source for this is the law website. So you can go there and uh, you know, have a look at the use case as well. So this uh, Atlan basically is a company which is building teams for, uh, which is building teams for database, uh, you know, companies, companies which deal with a lot of data. And uh, they have customers which are from various domains. They have customers from finance domain. They have customers from uh, you know, healthcare domain. And for all such domains, uh, it is very critical to safeguard their data. Their data cannot be compromised in any manner. So that's the core of it. So uh, security and isolation was a key for Atlan. And initially, when they started out, what they did was they went ahead with a hard multi-tenancy setup. So, in this case, what they were doing was they were setting up one EKS cluster for every customer. Every tenant they had, they had a separate EKS cluster for them. And as we saw in the earlier section, a separate cluster provides the most, the highest level of security and isolation. So, because each customer got it, it they were completely isolated from the other person. The data was, uh, you know, secured. They had uh, complete autonomy of the resources that could be done. So there was total privacy and uh, you know isolation that was present. But one of the major challenges that came here was that when the customers or when their customers started increasing, they, when they started scaling, at a point they realized that having one cluster per customer was very difficult to manage because when you when you are growing from one customer and then suddenly you go to hundred, having hundred fully blown 
aka eks clusters is very difficult to uh, manage so they were dealing with a lot of clusters uh, a lot of uh, difficulty when it comes to managing them matching their monitoring troubleshooting and and a whole lot of other things and what it was also doing was it was increasing their operational cost because for every cluster if i remember correctly they were they, they were actually paying aws about uh, $1000 a month and upwards and that's very expensive so as the number of customers increased uh it was also affecting the cost so that's when atlan uh, you know was searching for a solution that could give them the same degree of isolation the same degree of security that an individual cluster provides but something which was more scalable more easy to manage and also uh cost effective and that's why they uh, explored uh, multi tenancy and zeroed in on v clusters uh, the same demo that sachin showed so what they did over here was they dedicated one virtual cluster per customer so instead of giving them a dedicated fully blown aks cluster they gave them one virtual cluster per customer so with that they were able to give them the required amount of isolation the separation the security that was required so that uh, you know checkbox was ticked uh, what it was also doing was it reduced the number of physical clusters so now they didn't have to manage a physical cluster for each customer you know they were able to run let's say 10 uh, customers on one single cluster of ek so their physical clusters that they were using that reduced and what that did was it brought down everything else which was associated with it so it brought down the cost that were associated uh, it brought down the maintenance overhead it brought down the operational overheads uh, that was associated with a physical cluster so if you see this uh, use case it's a, it's it's a pretty good use case uh, to learn how someone went from a complete uh, you know one cluster setup where uh, the security and isolation was of paramount importance to a situation where they were able to bring down the cost and still maintain that level of uh, security and uh, isolation so uh, with that we come to the close of the webinar uh, in terms of what we had to discuss in terms of the strategies in terms of uh, you know all the multi tenant uh, techniques the the security consideration the compliance requirements and the uh, use case as well all right looks like we got some questions in the comments on uh, on linkedin so i am going to find the first one all right so um does v, does v cluster support any disaster recovery features configure configure and connect to secondary v cluster or like i guess maybe that'd be more like ha or something like that so does v cluster support any disaster recovery features um configure and connect to a secondary cluster but it's probably mostly like ha you know different api endpoints so that's our first question right uh, i guess for the applications i right now i don't think so it is autonomous as in uh, v cluster won't do it by default but i guess it is still possible and very easy to do it and configure it uh, for on our own basically so uh, ha uh, is uh, supported by v cluster but only for its own components being the database the hcd uh, database so to say so that is possible for the v cluster workload that's itself so yeah i hope that answers the question all right and then our next question is does v cluster have any application resiliency features on top of the host cluster uh I think for the application I do not yet think so but uh, it will still provide you with the resiliency features out of the box what kubernetes does because at the end of the day it is just a, another kubernetes distribution uh, you you do not have to think that it is a, a separate component or a separate thing you just deal with it, with it as as a kubernetes distribution so out of the box it is going to give you uh, whenever the pod goes down it is going to Uh, uh create another point uh, pod in its place so those all those features all those resiliency features you are uh, going to get by default so uh, yeah i think that that is particularly supported well by the cluster shares a feature set with uh with kubernetes so you're basically basing everything on kubernetes ability to to come back for uh if like a pod is deleted or something all right so we got another one yes, uh, yes. someone had asked previously while we we're on the sinker uh slide um if you could explain the sinker part in the previous slide so do you have the i don't know if you want to bring the the slide up um uh, yeah. sinker section sinker. probably just like a little description I'm not, I'm not sure it was on the slide i forgot i'm just getting it on board that sounds good yeah you have it yeah yeah for this particular so uh, ideally with v cluster what happens is v cluster uh, just provides you with uh, the control plane isolation so it is just going to uh, give you a separate api server where, where you are going to connect but it does not have a, a network uh, solution or maybe a storage solution 
uh, on its own. It is going to offload those particular requests back to the host cluster. So this is where the syncer component comes into picture. What it does is uh, it keeps a note of you know uh, certain uh, things that it is going to require to uh, sync back down to the host cluster. In our case, if I want to run certain pods, uh, just keeping the pods in the etc. Uh, etc. Uh, database of V cluster is not going to help. It is going to need to sync them back to the host cluster, where then the host uh, cluster uh, scheduler will come in picture. It is going to then go ahead and schedule those pods so that they start running. And what uh, the syncer is also going to do is it will sync the status back to the V cluster. So this is kind of uh, syncer will be uh, doing a two-way communication between the host cluster as well as uh, the V cluster namespace. And it is kind of the single point of contact in between the two. Uh, which gives you the illusion that you know uh, whatever uh, request or whatever activities uh, you are doing uh, in the cluster, uh, they are actually being done on the host cluster. But you still get the intuition that okay, everything is happened within the V cluster itself. So you know uh, from that point of view, Syncer is the uh, most important component. And I hope I have explained its uh, you know uh, working in pretty detail as as you may desire. I think that was great. All right, so we had uh, Ishan, one of our uh, developers, who said you can have V cluster backups using Valero. So you can look into like Valero. I think there's some documentation and stuff on it too. I mean, that's going to be like it's it's another Kubernetes like deployed thing, right? That you're going to be able to back up. All right, well, I think I think that's about all the questions we have. Let me refresh one more time just to see. Um, I think I think we're good. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, like everything was great. Um, We'll, like I said, we'll post the video um, of the of the demo in the comments later. But thank both thank thank both of you so much for coming on and presenting this information. Is there anything else you want to say before we uh, we head out for the day, or any buys or <laughs> outros or anything you want to say? Thank you uh, for coming on. Yeah, I think it was it, it was a great uh, learning curve for all of us as well because uh, you know the from the demo uh, side as well. And I think even you know from from a live stream perspective, how to deal with live webinars. I think that's a that, that's a key takeaway that that we are doing. So uh, I think in terms of uh, queries and questions, I think you know anyone who is watching, you can just reach out to either of us. We shared our Twitter handles, we shared our LinkedIn pages. So in case if you have anything specific to this particular webinar, you can reach out to us. Or if you think there was any area where we went wrong or we didn't give the correct answer, please feel free to reach out to us and correct us. That that helps us. Awesome. I so thank both of you so much. We'll have you on again, I think. I think we'll go over something else and then we'll, we'll get another demo video too to get, get another chance at that. Demos on live streams. All right. Well, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Like I said, watch the uh, event and we'll post some more information on there. But uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.